Hey, hey, I'm back. Today we're going to wrap up the review on the Tamiya TRF-211XM. Let's get cracking. Okay, before we get started with the build section of the review, let me just show you the car. Let me pop the body off and show you exactly what's going on. So basically, I actually think the body is actually not too bad. It's, it's not really a cab forward so much, and it's really not like a rear cab like old school. It's somewhere in the middle of the road, a little bit more slanted. Definitely doesn't look bad. They should have made it a little bit longer, I think, just so that it covered more of the transmission, but it is what it is. Now, I've already pulled the motor out of the car, but the car, we were actually running a SureSpeed 17.5 when we were running it in stock, and we ran a Trinity 7.5 when we ran it in mod. The SureSpeed was geared at like 32.69 with an associated gear. I will say this, for some reason, it seemed like the pinion would rub on the gear cover when we ran it in stock, so we ran it with no gear cover. In mod, I want to say we ran it at like 23.79 or thereabouts, really close to that in the car. It was actually really good, not too hot. The only thing we ended up breaking was right here. We ended up breaking one of the wing mounts when I backflipped the car, and it's it's not really a big deal. It just it is what it is. We ended up using. I'm pretty sure my buddy actually sent me the servo. It's just a, a Futaba Super Shorty servo, an LRP Flow Works team, which worked really really well. And I ended up using, of course, my Airtronics radio equipment and the Reedy Brick Pack, the Square Pack. It actually comes with some stoppers that you can use up, up here farther forward in the chassis that you can run like a standard, either a long LiPo or a nickel cadmium battery. But if you look carefully, you'll see that there really is no option for mounting a shorty from the factory. Now, I know guys have mounted shorties and stuff like that, and, and I'm sure that, it, I'm sure that there, it probably doesn't take a lot of work to make that happen. You probably just need to create some type of a mount right here if you want to run it in line. And if you wanted to run it transversely, you'd probably have to just grind these ribs down. But anyways, I just wanted to run you through the car. We ended up running the car with Proline Electrons. They worked really, really well. And uh, overall, I guess that's just about it. That's the uh, TRF-211XM. Let's get on with the build. Okay, let's talk about the build. Tamiya TRF-211XM. The build actually went really good. There were, some, there were some issues in the manual that I'll get to in a minute, but let me just tell you some of, the, some of the specifics. The metals and the plastics in this kit are really manufactured to like the highest degree there. They, the fit and finish is amazing. I mean, the transmission, when it's assembled, just spins like, like frictionless. It's just really amazing. I was really just amazed at the quality of the materials in the kit. And overall, everything fit and finished and went together really well, but there are some flaws. And the first thing that I want to mention is that right here in the very opening page of the manual, it says to use a screwdriver. It doesn't say Phillips. It doesn't say JIS, which stands for Japanese International Standard. It just says a screwdriver. And the fact is, you're really going to want a Japanese International Screwdriver or JIS screwdriver if you're going to assemble this kit Specifically because if you look at this diagram right here, you can see that there's a clear difference between Japanese International Standard and Phillips. And a Phillips head screwdriver will probably get the job done, but it's probably going to mar up the head a little bit and everything. It just, it just doesn't fit snugly inside any of the JIS screws. So to me, I wish you'd have told us that we needed a JIS screwdriver or even included a really inexpensive one in the kit to make life a little bit easier for us. And so that's that. The next thing I want to talk about is in the manual. You actually have to Dremel the rear arms on this car. Because if you don't, like in, this little, like in this little clip right here, you can see that the arms will actually run into the outdrive. And I'm sure that if you do not Dremel the arms, that sooner or later when those arms run into the outdrive on a really harsh landing, there's a good chance you'll break or bend an outdrive and that would obviously be no fun. So with, that, with those two things covered, let me just move on from there. In the manual, the thing that really kind of bums me out, to me has always been known for having amazing manuals. The illustrations are good. The one-to-one -one diagrams for like screws and washers are really good. But you can see in this image, they actually show you a little shaded spot where you need to dremel the arm. And first of all, let me just say that I don't think you should be dremeling anything at this level. Not, not only should you not be dremeling anything here in 2015, this isn't 1985. A 12-year-old kid shouldn't have to dremel the arms on a brand new four or $500 kit. But even if he does, you see that it's obviously there's a shaded diagram right here. But on the very next page, it doesn't show the arms with the relief in them. And some people are probably saying, oh, that's not a big deal. But why not? These, these instructions are so detailed. Why not just show the arms with the actual relief in them after they've been dremeled? That way, if you miss something, it's easy to catch maybe in the next diagram. Or it just, it just makes life better, right? 
And then my second gripe about the manual is the body. After I built the whole kit, I was actually pretty happy with it. I actually built it. I missed the Dremeling thing. So as I was compressing the suspension, I noticed some bind. I went back through and I saw it in the manual. Dremeled it, all clears, all is good. But what I did was when it was all done, I flipped to the back of the manual because I know that's how to me a manuals are. And I looked at the body on the kit and I cut the body out. I cut the, the lines on the body to match the image. Well, then when I flipped the page, so let me show you that image. So this is the image that I saw and used as a reference for when I decided to cut out the body. Then when I flipped the page, here's the other image I, can, I saw. And you'll see that they left a little, I don't know, maybe eight millimeters, seven millimeter flap at the top of the body. Why would these images not match? I mean, one is actually subsequent to the next. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I actually found out that I'd cut the body out wrong because after posting a picture on Facebook, someone actually messaged me. So Tamiya, what are you doing? Why, why one image on the first page and then not using the same image on the second page? I would understand if there was a cutout that would show like something that you're supposed to be doing, like some operation or installation procedure, but there was none of that. So the manual, I really wasn't impressed with, but the build itself was actually really, really good because of the high quality materials and the fit and finish. Let's talk performance. The Tamiya TRF211XM the build actually went pretty good. The manual could have been better as we already said, but the build itself was pretty darn good. And I have to be honest with you, I was pretty amazed at how good the setup was out of the box. There are a lot of other good kits out there and I'm just gonna compare another Japanese kit, a Kyosho RB6 for instance. But when I got my RB6, it had like five hole pistons and the stock setup was eh, medium at best. This Tamiya kit, the setup is really close. I mean, really, really close. It has two hole one sixes up front, two hole one sevens in the rear. I don't know exactly what the spring rates are, but I can tell you that right out of the box, all we did was break tires in. We just kept breaking tires in and I moved the shocks, the rear shocks out on the tower one or two holes and I would absolutely be happy to go compete with this car. It jumps good. It's easy to keep the nose up or nose down, whatever you want to do. It lands good when you're not flat bottoming in the middle of a double as you're about to see. Steve, I saw your, I saw your comment on Facebook. I didn't want to flat bottom it, but if you case that baby, it's far worse than a little bit of flat bottoming. Uh, the cornering is really good. And something that I noticed is that it's got a very, the car definitely had a little bit more of a push than I would want in a full on race car. But as the tires came in, the car just kept getting better and better. So in the footage that I show you, I want you to know that the tires are about 80% there. Like they're good, they're not great. I'm sure that probably with four or five more runs, they would have came up to like full race pace. But nevertheless, I was still really impressed with how balanced the car was. When you wanted to use some push brake to kind of check the car up, it would slide and kind of check. It was just a very consistent, easy to drive setup and just the car itself was easy to drive. So it jumped good, landed good. Could have used a little bit more corner speed, but I think most of that's tires because it just, like I said, it was pushy. You're not gonna have a, a truckload of corner speed when the car is pushing. And uh, acceleration was really good. Braking was really good. Although I did notice, and it's hard to say if it was the surface or tires or what, but I did notice that as I was adjusting like my the percentage of EPA on my brake, my brake rate, there was kind of like this fine line where the car was really easy to drive and really fast. And then if you just went just a couple of clicks too much on the brake, it just kind of locked the tires up too much. And so I don't notice that in some of my other kits and it's, it's hard to say. I've been racing a lot of three gear kits. So there could be something to be said about three gear versus four gear difference. I really don't know. But the bottom line is I really, really liked the way the car drove right out of the box of the kit setup. Jumped good, landed good, corner good, braked good, accelerated good, no complaints. Performance on the box, very, very good. Let's talk durability. This car was actually pretty good. The only thing we ended up breaking was a wing mount, a rear driver's side wing mount. When I actually backflipped the car, taking off, I'll show you real quick, I was, we were goofing off. I wasn't sure if the tires were hooking up and I went to grab it and it just came over faster than I could lift. And it was, uh, we broke one little wing mount, nothing else. And we did have some pretty harsh landings. We definitely ran into some pipes at high speed. So I think the durability is probably pretty good. But something I want to bring up is that this car basically, when I was assembling this car, it just had like this very familiar like look to it. And so I broke out my camera and I took a couple pictures of some old B4 arms matched up against these to me arms. So let me show you real quick. You can see that the, the front arms are basically the spitting image, the shock holes are a little bit different and the rear arms here in this picture, they're almost the exact same thing. That brings up a whole nother issue about manufacturers either copying or using other manufacturers for inspiration. And I have to wonder as far as durability is concerned, because this car was based, the arms are clearly almost identical to B4 arms. 
How durable can they be? I mean, are the plastics that much better? I really just don't know, so I'm just sharing my experience. I thought the car seemed pretty durable. I definitely hit some stuff, crashed some stuff, cased some stuff, and I didn't break anything except for a wing mount. So I'm thinking that the Tamiya plastics are really high quality, but still, I find it hard to believe that this car is going to be as durable as some of the new generation cars like the B5M and B5M Lite. One of the drawbacks to a lot of these exotic kits and kits that aren't super popular wherever you live is that a lot of times the local manufacturers, the big name manufacturers that make the aftermarket or the hop-up stuff don't make parts for your car. So this particular car, there's all kinds of companies that, that have parts that will fit. This, is, this happens to be like a steering rack from TRF. Of course, they've got the nice aluminum balls that go on the shock end so that you don't bind everything up. And then there's other parts like, like Exotech, like wing washers and thumb screws for the battery strap. So there are Tier, to me, is actually making some parts for the car that, that are hop-ups. And then, of course, there are other products just that are designed for other cars or just many platforms in general that will fit. Not to mention stuff like this right here. This is actually a B5 steering block with a hex on it because this car obviously has pins in the rear axles and bearings in the front. We'll talk about that more around the conclusion or value. And so there's a lot of different things you can put on this car to hop it up and to make it better. And there's actually a dedicated forum over at RC Tech. I'll include a link down in the description where a lot of guys that are diehard Tamiya fans, they share their information. And I would encourage you to head over there, read up and talk to some of the guys that are running this car and find out exactly what they're doing to, you know, just hop it up, make it a little bit better. One more thing. I think there's a pretty good chance that uh, B4 or B5 arms will work on this kit. I haven't tried the B5 stuff, but I think there's a really good chance that B4 arms would be a direct replacement. So while Tamiya parts availability might not be awesome and the aftermarket isn't huge for this car, there are still some probably alternative options. I didn't try to put the B4 stuff on, but as you could see in the photo earlier, it looks like a, almost like a direct, direct fit, so. All right, let's talk value. If you've seen any of my past videos, you know that I really feel like value is super important and that there's really kind of two kind of sides to that coin. One is that, one is the value of the parts, the plastics and the metals that you actually get in the box. It's the actual value of the actual hard items. And then the second, the second side or the flip side is really parts availability, driver setups, race team, just kind of like the whole global experience of owning the car. Now, one of the things that really, in my opinion, really hurts the Tamiya is the fact that it has pins in the rear axles and uses bearings in the front wheels. Now that can be remedied relatively inexpensively, 25 or 30 bucks. But let me just give you an idea. If you drive a B5 or a Kia Shore RB6 and you wanna buy this car and you have 500 bucks in wheels and tires, if you were to buy this car and you wanted to run the Tamiya wheels, which that would be a terrible idea, but if you did, you'd have to get rid of all those wheels and tires just to run pins in the rear, and bearings in the front. What you would do is you would buy the car and you'd either put B5 steering blocks on it or some type of a hex conversion. You, you can learn more about that at RC Tech. But long story short is, this car costs about 575 bucks over at Tower, but you can find it at eBay for around 400 bucks shipped. So 400 bucks shipped isn't a super bad deal. I don't know, let's just say 30, 40 bucks for a hex conversion for the front and rear of the car. Now you're talking 440, 450. It's not a bad deal especially for as nice as the kit is. The plastics are amazing, the metals are amazing. But with that said, I don't know that the, while 450 bucks for the kit and a hex conversion isn't terribly bad, the other side is just completely lacking. They don't really have any serious presence in any hobby shop that I'm aware of, at least not here in the United States. There's no real factory team. I've got some buddies that actually drive for Tamiya and they do have some like a, a small sponsorship network of guys that drive, but there's no real big factory presence. And at the end of the day, you're, if you really want parts, your best bet probably is gonna be eBay. I just did some Googling and it's really hard to come up with Tamiya stuff. So I don't know, I don't know how serious Tamiya really is about kind of penetrating the American or the United States market, but they clearly can't be super serious. Otherwise they would have a bigger driver network and they would have more of a presence in some of these hobby shops and stuff like that. So anyways, value. I think that the, the, if you buy the kit off eBay, the value is fair. I think that if you buy it off tower, it's a terrible value and that just is what it is. All right, let's talk conclusion. Here is the basic gist of the Tamiya TRF 211XM. It's a beautifully crafted, beautifully made Japanese kit. It's got plastics and metals that are manufactured to the highest order. I mean, it's, 
It's literally beautiful. The springs have this iridescent color. The shock bodies have this amazing coating. The plastics are molded flawlessly. It's got some, it's got some flaws. The manual has some flaws. The fact that they're still using a Phillips head or a Japanese international standard style screw anywhere on the kit to me is more or less unacceptable. It's not that it's the end of the world because if you've built any number of kits in the past, you probably have enough metric screws to just replace those Phillips head or Japanese international standard screws with screws that you already have. But uh, the kit is amazing, but clearly to me it is just flat out out of touch. There's no reason in the year 2015, we're knocking on the door of 2016, there's no reason that this kit shouldn't have came with hexes in the box for the price that they're charging for this kit. If you actually look at their website, their MSRP is like $830. And of course, if you ever own a Tamiya product, you know that that's always the case. They never sell for that much. You can get this kit for 575 bucks at Tower or 400 bucks shipped to your door if you go hunt for it on eBay. But at the end of the day, I think that the, the, the setup out of the box works amazingly well. They've done their homework. It's got two hole 16s in the front, two hole 17s in the back. I don't know what the spring rates are, but all I ended up doing to this car to make it do exactly what I wanted it to do was go ahead and move the shocks out on the rear tower. One thing that I really didn't cover up to this point, this kit wasn't designed at all for a shorty battery. So I ended up using a square battery when I ran the car. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's like a saddle that's joined up. It's a reedy square pack. And it's just, it's just little things like that that prove that to me it's kind of out of touch. I mean, sending a kit that has pins in the rear axles, bearings in the front wheels, isn't set up for a shorty. Just they don't have a factory driver network. They don't have a top factory pro that's out there competing, demonstrating. There's no doubt in my mind that if we put this car in the hands of Ryan Mayfield or Ty Tessman or Cavalier or any of those guys, if they could go out and get work done with this car. But the bottom line is Tamiya isn't doing that. So, so who is this car for and who, should you buy this car? I would say if you travel, you don't want to fly to Texas if you live in Michigan or California, get there, end up having a breakage for some part that you just would never think you'd break and then you can't get it and you're not running. But if you're a club racer and you just like to go club racing and it doesn't matter if the car breaks, you can wait a couple days for parts or whatever, then that's a much better option for you guys. So I guess let me just say this. Would I recommend that you buy this product? Mm, probably not. If you're a travel racer, definitely not. If you're a local guy, then that's fine. I think this one is better left to the dedicated diehard Tamiya fans because it's a super nice kit. But they've just they've just missed the mark on this one, and I it just bums me out because my whole life growing up, man, I had I had a couple of grasshoppers, the grasshopper two, the lunchbox, the falcon. Uh, I had an uh, Avante, I think not an Avante, I had a Vanquish. I just had tons of of to me. I I, I wanted a frog so very bad when I was a kid. My dad didn't get it for me, um, but it just kind of bums me out because I they've done such a good job with like the car handle so good, but. They're just missing the boat in so many other areas. So I don't know, maybe this car was just designed for Japan and they don't care about shorty lipos and stuff like that over there, but it's a big part of the market here in the United States. So, okay, so that's been the review on the Tamiya TRF211XM. Hope you guys enjoyed watching this video just as much as I enjoyed making it. There's a bunch of new video reviews for newer kits coming out, eight scale, 10 scale, nitro, electric, all kinds of stuff. So stay tuned and we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. Can you change the gearing? Yeah. A lot that bad, eh? Let's see if it's getting hot. Alright, we got a Trinity 7.5 strapped in. This is still only the third run ever on these tires. They're definitely getting better, but let's see how she handles, I guess.
I just want to say thanks again for watching my videos. I appreciate you guys watching. If you enjoyed this video, you'd be doing me a huge favor if you could either like, comment, or even better, subscribe. I post a lot of stuff on social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, stuff like that. So if you want to catch up with me, I'll post this stuff up for you. And you can come on over, add me as a friend, follow me on Instagram, and you'll be able to see things that just don't make it to YouTube. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.